writer, director, and son, not my son, but John Landis's son, Max Landis. I heard your clap dying down during shout. <laughs> I'm one of the only people in the world who can show up to one of these wearing something his mom made and it's kind of cool. I thought it would be good since I'm a John Landis, Deborah Landis collaboration that I would wear one, although I do look like I'm about to go to Comic-Con. <laughs> um, uh, my heart's going a million miles a minute. I hate reading off paper. As you'll see when my father speaks, we're both better off the cuff. Uh, so I'm going to try to read this. Uh, my father has repeatedly said to me in various locations and contexts and situations and outfits, and bear in mind he once said this in his pajamas, uh, that he hate, I hate the idea of a Lifetime Achievement Award because it is, and I'm paraphrasing here, tantamount to declaring the recipient dead. <laughs> Imagine getting one while you're still fucking alive, he continued once. It's like they hand it to you and then they shoot you in the head. <laughs> you're dead. I did that wrong. It's, you're dead, would be the correct John Landis impression. Now, undoubtedly, my appearance here, look, I'm holding on to this like I'm about to fall down. Okay. I'm a screenwriter. We don't do crowds. Uh, undoubtedly, my appearance here is already sending my father into a congealed fit of eyebrow raises, eye rolls, and groans. But have no fear. These all are all his perfectly normal, expected responses to praise and compliments, especially in public, especially from me. Now, his astonishment at my appearance uh, by now is facilitated only by his refusal to have a Facebook or Twitter page. So round of applause for that. <laughs> but n now I assume it's moved on to his natural state of barely restrained panic whenever he sees me standing in front of a microphone. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's talk John Landis. Soft-spoken, tactful, genteel polite. These are words I have never heard used to describe my father. <laughs> His catchphrase, and at this point I'm surprised he hasn't trademarked it, is, you haven't seen blank. With blank being a movie you haven't seen, or maybe even heard of, that he just mentioned casually, usually while describing something else. Uh, easy example. You've never seen Son of Kong? No, you probably haven't. But if my father is saying this, then you probably should have seen it. Because my father's mock outrage at your not having seen Son of Kong, which is great, by the way, doesn't stem from a place of pretension. My father is the least pretentious person I have ever met, especially within the film industry. It is shocking how sincere he is. It comes from somewhere much deeper and more meaningful. My father has something precious few people I meet in the industry and I meet a lot these days have, and that's passion. He has actual passion, actual love for film which is weirdly rare amongst the people who make the big decisions in this industry. It feels too personal. It feels too personal and too selfish. I feel like I'm often hearing people ask, what can film do for me? But for my father, it was always, what can I do for film? And you can feel that. You can really feel that when you talk to him. This guy's road to directed started in a mail room, an actual mail room. An actual mailroom. <laughs> and included stints as a stuntman and a grip. Can you say that any modern film director has had that level of involvement at different levels within the industry? No, you can't. Oh, congratulations, you went to art school. While you were letting your director of photography direct your short, my father was willingly being lit on fire to go crashing through a window in the towering inferno. I can't look at you during it, oh, cry, sorry. Okay. But somehow the brain persevered. I remember the first time, vividly, that I remember, that I realized my father was special. He'd had a long history of interrupting movies. Watch this, he'd say, randomly, as we watched Inner Space on Laserdisc. <laughs> Except nothing was happening on screen. Uh-oh, he'd say, as nothing went on on a VHS copy of The Lion King. Ooh, yikes he'd say as Sinbad uneventfully wandered into a cave. He'd even do it during new movies in the theater. Uh-oh, watch this. Here it comes. Who's that? Why? 
Why was he reacting to nothing? <laughs> it took me years to understand what was happening. And when it hit me, it hit me like a freight train. My father wasn't reacting to the story being told in the way that I was used to and in the way most people watch movies. The weird Tourette syndrome had very little to do with the action on screen. <laughs> Instead, it was about the way the action on, this is true, it was, it was about the way the action on screen was being presented. My father speaks the language of cinema so fluently that he was subconsciously reacting to changes in the music, the cinematography, subtle shifts in editing to predict, to predict that, yes, Scar was about to pop out and kill Mufasa, and yes, Neo was about to encounter Agent Smith for the first time. Yes, the T-Rex was indeed out of its pen, and that goat was fucked. <laughs> I will never forget going to see The Matrix in Hawaii with my family. It's one of my clearest memories of my family. When, after Neo was pulled into a room, none of us having seen the trailers with the agents, my father said, at a normal speaking voice irritating the people in front of us, my father said, these guys aren't human. <laughs> there was nothing to tell him that. <laughs> and I remember th the first time I recognized this was, was actually uh, w weirdly like in 1996, I was like 11, and I was looking at him on the couch and I thought, oh shit. He just reacted to the way we were shown something. This guy is on another level. And I was never able in many ways to recover my image of him. Alongside being my father, he had become something else and something bigger. And I recognized for the first time what the fuss was about and why people always wanted his autograph. Incidentally, I had a similar moment with my mother the first time I saw her mind-blowing presentation on how costumes shape characters, but we can talk about that when I get asked to introduce her for her Lifetime Achievement Award if they can't afford someone better. <laughs> Talking about my favorite directing moments from my father's film strikes me as corny and false and BuzzFeed. I'm here to talk about the lifetime of a person who I've known literally since the day I was born. Actually, literally since before saying, oh, he's a very good director and here's a list of my favorites is just silly and dumb, but so we're clear, it's the reaction shots of the dog in Coming to America. <laughs> Who would think of that? It's so, okay. Uh, Dad, I love you so, so, so much. You are an incredibly brave, intelligent person who is completely one of a kind, and every day I'm thankful to have grown up alongside a person so weirdly similar to myself, with such a great patience for all my problems and difficulties, and there were and are a lot, uh, who has given me the bizarre and incredible experience of being wrapped in celluloid from the day I was born. Who else saw Jason and the Argonauts before they were five? Uh, for teaching me to love movies and being excited about them in a way that isn't bullshit, which is really hard to do, and for supporting me emotionally and with advice and love, even as I undertook the job of screenwriter, a career you once described to me in the car in Florida as being similar to an emotional punching bag that would undoubtedly drive me insane. <laughs> you. You are a great father. And it must be weird for you to hear that coming from another adult man. <laughs> but you are a great, great father, and I think my sister would agree. You are not dead, but you have earned this. Like my father, I have a tendency to talk longer than most people and make it frustratingly hard to tell me to shut up and sit down by continuously saying interesting things. For instance, my girlfriend Dylan just sold a pitch to HBO and his exact pr producer on her first greenlit movie. <laughs> cool, uh, but I think I've talked long enough and this jacket is way sweatier than I thought it would be up here. <laughs> I wrote that, but actually it's quite comfortable. <laughs> so I think it's time I... Thank you, you're being very generous to a very nervous guy. So I think it's past time for me to introduce a friend, uh, a mentor, my direct genetic forebearer, a fellow Disneyland and Ray Harryhausen enthusiast, and one of the few actual geniuses I've had the privilege of knowing, John Landis. Who is this man and 
what have you done with my son? You, well, the Dallas International Film Festival has genuinely surprised me. <laughs> Max. I'm going to read my speech, which is much shorter than your speech. I, I'm, I'm gobsmacked. I'm really, do you know, when we came in tonight, uh, I don't know, who, where is he? I'll find some guy introduced himself to me and he said, isn't it exciting that your son Max is here? And I thought, and I thought to myself, what a schmuck. <laughs> and I said, no, uh, Max is not here, asshole. You know, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so, uh, Max. He's never said anything that nice to me before. <laughs> 